Local Investment Committee. It'll come to order. It is Tuesday, February 20th at 3 p.m. And welcome all the members who are here on time and welcome to the members who will be joining us shortly, I'm sure. Uh, the first thing we have on the agenda is from the Department of Administration. We're learning more about the Sustainable Building Guideline recommendations. So if um, Mr. Oslowski is here and Dr. Graves, please come and join us and Welcome to the committee, and proceed with your recommendation. And somebody is hybrid, set designer. And who is okay. Madam Chair, right. uh, members, for the record, Wayne Wislowski, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Administration. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, present our recommendations uh, from the report that. Center for Sustainable Building Research put together, and with me is Richard Graves, uh, the director for the center. So he's going to walk through the uh, presentation. Welcome, Dr. Graves. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Pappas and uh, members of the committee. Um, I have slides, but I think they're in your packet, so I could just uh, um, walk through them and refer to the slides as I go. So. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Richard Graves, and I am the director of the Center for Sustainable Bu Building Research at the University of Minnesota. Uh, CSBR developed updates, provides technical assistance, and works with project teams for the Minnesota Sustainable Building Guidelines Program, also known as, the, as B3, uh, for the Departments of Administration and Commerce. Uh, the program was created by the legislature in 2001 and has been uh, updated uh, over the years. Um, now I'm on the second slide. The B3 program involves a number of parts from the guidelines that are used on capital construction projects for new renovated or combined buildings, the SB 2030 energy and carbon standard that is used for the requirements uh, for B3. Um, SB 2030 is also used as the energy carbon standard for a number of municipalities green building ordinances. Uh, and the standard was used as a roadmap for future versions of the Commercial Energy Code uh, in Minnesota that was passed last session. And finally, the B3 program also tracks energy usage, provides operations improvement processes, and conducts, conducts post-occupancy evaluations uh, on existing buildings and completed uh, projects. During its 20-plus um, year history, uh, over 4,000 people have worked on uh, B3 projects from, from design teams to, to contractors to project owners of, of various sizes and types. Um, you know, 492 projects have, are enrolled in the B3 guidelines at various phases of design, construction, and occupancy. These projects are lo located across Minnesota and range from large stadiums and multifamily housing projects to park buildings. Uh, transit stations and the historic Fort Snelling revitalization you can see a, pho a photograph of. Together these buildings are estimated to save uh, close to 1 million uh, MMBTUs of annual energy savings. This is like eliminating the building and energy emissions from the city of Falcon Heights every year and saves uh, the state of Minnesota uh, public building owners um, millions of, do of operation dollars every year. And finally, uh, over 10,500 public buildings are tracking their operational energy use through B3 benchmarking to help a variety of public and private sector building owners run their buildings more efficiently. In the last session, the legislature requested a report with the recommendations with recommendations for the program. CSBR worked with the Department of Administration to deliver the report on October 15, 2023. The report made recommendations in the following areas, uh, updating program goals and measuring performance, applicability of B3 for projects, um, for pro different project types, uh, giving com look, reviewing compliance and giving waivers for uh, program requirements, outreach and training for design teams and owners, administration of the program and resources and support for the program uh, going forward. Uh, the process that we used to get stakeholder uh, input uh, for the report involved uh, sending out a survey to over 2,500 uh, members of the B3 listserv that uh, involves everybody involved in projects. Um, uh, we also uh, did four focus groups with more than 62 people participating 
that involve design teams and contractors, state agencies and owners of um, B3 projects, advocacy groups, and then we had a fourth uh, focus group that we brought everybody together just to have more opportunities for them to have discussions. In addition, we had additional meetings with stakeholders to address representation gaps in the survey process and focus groups uh, and to increase uh, participation. And those additional meetings involved having meetings with design teams, contractors and owners in greater Minnesota, uh, um, small design teams that work on nonprofit projects, owners of nonprofit and municipal projects that might uh, need to do uh, B3 um, depending on the funding source, subcontractors, suppliers, trade associations, environmental groups, and green building organizations. So the findings, um, the specific findings and recommendations can be uh, found in the report um, that's in your packet. But in summary, uh, the existing statutes focus on the creation of the B3 program and have not been updated for the administration um, uh, and management of the Minnesota Sustainable Building Guidelines program. Um, also, the statutes are complicated and confusing in the requirements for projects, which projects are required to use the B3 guidelines depending upon if they're a new project, a renovated project, some combination, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the statutes do not include um, education training, compliance tracking, or giving waivers or scope determinations for projects, which is needed to, um, to just simply run a program with a wide variety of um, project types. <clears throat> In addition, some of the things we found through, through surveys and focus groups are, you know, many project owners do not understand their responsibilities for working on B3 projects and giving approvals for project teams to, to move projects forward. Um, funding has not been, up, been updated uh, for inflation or uh, changes in scope for the program over the years. Um, and then uh, finally, the B3 program provides many benefits for not only state construction, um, but across the broader uh, construction and building industry uh, in Minnesota. So, you know, summary of, of recommendations, and again, more specific findings and recommendations can be found on the report. Um, are to update the statutes to have the Department of Administration oversee and administer the program. Uh, this will provide accountability, uh, a process for determining waivers um, from the requirements and scope determinations. It'll also allow for compliance tracking and reporting um, to the department, but also back to the legislature on how the program is doing and, and what we're getting for project compliance. Um, we're also recommending streamlining the B3 goals and, and application of those to, to projects. Um, for example, um, we've, we, we recommended in the report thinking about a minimum project size. We've done some additional work since the report was, was uh, sent to you that we feel pretty confident that a 10,000 square foot minimum size um, would be a good recommendation because that would, um, we have a lot of projects that are smaller than that, but it makes up a very small percentage of the overall square footage and environmental impact of of programs in B3. We also feel that a common definition for new renovation and addition projects uh, would help um, streamline and clarify uh, which projects are required to uh, meet the guidelines. We also feel that we could refine and simplify the B3 um, guidelines in, in some ways to have fewer requirements but still make um, the impact and meet the goals that um, the legislature is looking for. Uh, and then we feel that we, sh we can and should be reporting um, key performance indicators to revise, uh, to, to revise goals uh, from, from the legislature. Um, we're, we're currently reporting indicators with our scorecard, but, but we can align our scorecard with, with a revised set of goals. And then finally, you know, if education and training is part of the scope of the B3 program, um, what we found um, from the survey and focus groups that that stakeholders are looking for online, educa online education and training by their project role, um, and that there's the need for new education and training for project owners and first time uh, uh, participants in the program. And then uh, finally, there's a need for updating the project tracking tool and, and resources to streamline design and review. So finally, um, 
we have, the CSBR has been working with the Department of Administration to make very limited updates and process improve, improvements that do not require additional funding uh, and or legislative action. Those involve exploring the idea of upda updating program goals, measuring performance and refining the guidelines like I just talked about previously, uh, reviewing the impact of creating a minimum size for, for project applicability, and then developing standardized practices for reviewing project doc documentation um, uh, to speed up approvals and review of projects. Um, and then finally, looking at statute changes and additional funding required to address the recommendations found in the report. Um, so thank you, Chair, and we're here to answer questions. So Dr. Graves and um, Assistant Commissioner, there isn't legislation yet, but is there, uh, is the department or is your organization, the, um, the research center, are you working on legislation or what's the process that's been going on since the report and, and continuing? Assistant Commissioner. Madam, Madam Chair, members, um, we certainly wanted to get the report in front of the legislature and have that conversation. We did have extensive conversations last session, um, particularly over in the House on uh, some potential legislation. We think from the work that was done to survey stakeholders and get additional feedback, there's some modifications that would be needed to that language, but there is essentially um, some language that could be ready to go to implement that the recommendations in the report. Um, it obviously requires a discussion around funding as well. Well, we know funding is a problem this year, but if there's recommendations that we could proceed with, uh, with little or limited funding, um, I think we want to at least keep the ball rolling so that we can address some of these issues that Dr. Graves found out with in the report. Um, any questions, Senator Rasmussen? Thank you, Madam Chair. Question, um, when we're thinking about B3, do we have any estimates for how much these requirements add to the total project cost of different capital projects on which it's applied to? Um, Dr. Graves. Yeah, th thank you, Senator. The, so we track, um, we try to track the additional co capital construction cost and time uh, required on B3 projects um, and have done some studies trying to track that. One of the challenges is the wide variety of project size, sizes and, um, and uh, project team expertise with the requirements. Historically, when we did a study about five years ago, we found the increase, increased uh, capital, capital construction cost was like one to 3% uh, for projects at that, at that time. But that's one of the things that we talk about in the report that we would like to keep um, to make cost be one of the metrics that we're tracking so that we can do a more thorough study of cost benefit analysis of increased capital costs, but what are the what are the returns? Any other questions? Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, so Senator Rasmussen asked the first part of the question I was going to ask, and I was going to ask the second part as well, which was, um, uh, do we also keep track of, I mean, so a lot of these have to do with uh, energy conservation, efficiency, <laughs> healthy buildings, um, et cetera. Um, uh, and I was wondering if we have any data that shows um, the operational uh, benefit, either direct benefit you know, in terms of um, you know, better, more efficient use of, of energy <clears throat> and or um, you know, the benefit to organizations having better lighting, healthier workers, better air, et cetera. Some of the both uh, direct benefits and or externalities that, that yeah. we might be able to track. Don't know if you do that, just wondering, thanks. Dr. Graves. Uh, yes, Senator, we, so we have a scorecard for every project so you can look at the project level um, of what the uh, savings are for uh, energy, water usage, uh, reduced construction waste, et cetera, et cetera. We roll all those up um, with quarterly reports um, to the department on total energy savings, total carbon savings. Um, in addition, the post-occupancy evaluations that I mentioned, 
Um, we do somewhere between two and eight post-occupancy evaluations every year where we um, survey building occupants for um, improvements to their well-being um, uh, of the projects for things like lighting, better indoor air quality, um, and other um, issues in those projects. So those are the kinds of things that, you know, creating a more sys um, systematic way to kind of report up to those metrics um, and scoop the whole program together would, I think, would have uh, a lot of benefits to the state project teams and others, so. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, doc Dr. Graves, I was interested in a little bit more on your comments regarding streamlining the B3 goals and application. Mm. And the first part was pretty clear. Project minimum size looks like 10,000 square feet was, is pretty clear. I'm, I'm curious, do you have any um, similar type clarity regarding the common definition for new, renova for new renovations or additions? Dr. Graves. Um, we haven't, uh, Senator, we haven't worked through the exact kind of definition uh, with the department on exactly how to streamline that common um, definition for, for new buildings, renovations, and additions, other than it ought to be the same requirement, um, but we haven't worked through the specific, um, the specific language. I think we drafted something when we started to develop a bill, but we, we haven't finalized that. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and Mr. Graves, Dr. Graves. So um, th that would be interesting to get, because as uh, Senator Papa said, money is going to be tight, mm -hmm. uh, but there are things that can be done uh, regarding, like, changing the minimum size required, mm -hmm. um, or changing that to not required, I guess, or required over 10,000 square feet. So those very simple uh, clarity things I think would be important, like changing the minimum size or clarifying that, and then the new definition about what, what, it, what those um, new or renovation or additions are, what are the difference between them. I think that would be helpful. And the third, uh, the last thing I would say would be really helpful is to refine and simplify the B3 guidelines. Those are great things that would help us moving forward, and they should not cost anything, but they would make it uh, so that going forward, uh, things would be um, probably more, more efficient, get better outcomes, uh, maybe with less frustration. So that I, I would be interested in seeing if, if you have put together clarity on any of those other issues. Dr. Graves. Um, so in terms of the project minimum size um, and the the kind of reduced set of key performance indicators. We, we floated those in front of the focus groups to get kind of a general feeling and agreement on those. So, so that, I, I agree, is, could be kind of low cost, no cost, um, with significant process improvements. Uh, a more comprehensive kind of reduction of the total number of guidelines, um, fortunately or unfortunately, requires the remaking of project tracking tools, documentation, education, training. So that would require kind of short-term funding to do that work, redo those tools to then kind of get the return on streamlining um, down the road. So we're, we're, what we're doing right now is trying to, to scope that out and figure out how, uh, how much it would take to do that um, and what the process would, would entail. Uh, Senator Nelson. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this might j just, I'll be very careful in my question. It's just that aren't some of those things just part of continual improvement that would be done? I, I mean, I, I guess I'm just a little at a loss why additional funding would be needed to update documents uh, and, and, and that type of thing. Why can that not be just part of the process that, you know, all agencies, departments, projects take on. It's just part of, you know, continual improvement. So I must be missing something as to why there needs to be an additional cost to have those type of document simplifications and improvements. 
Looks like Assistant Commissioner Wozlowski is going to take that. Madam Chair, Senator Nelson, uh, it's certainly a reasonable and fair, fair question. Um, I think as uh, Mr. Graves mentioned, um, we, this B3 hasn't had any funding increase since its inception in 2005, so it's been level funding, and obviously in, inflation is, is certainly taken a bite out of, of the resources that, that are available. So I think that is certainly one thing, but there is you know, um, a fair amount of work that's going to be involved in, in reformatting the tools that are made available, uh, along with some additional education that would be needed. Uh, we still put this, you know, there's things that can be done that we think are on the lower cost range um, that uh, we can come forward with, but it, there is, if to do a wholesale rework of the guidelines, um, you know, this is a, it's a workflow tool, so it's going to take some resources to redo that tool. Thank you. One last comment. Senator Nelson. I uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, the uh, budget is currently now on auto inflation, so uh, the next budget will have inflationary increases in it automatically. So I would hope that some of these things could be taken care of just as part of the regular budgeting uh, going forward. Thank you. We have a question from our Senate Council who is online with us on the report on page 12. Um, Dr. Graves, if you could just speak a little bit about this and kind of explain the, how the score, scorecard works. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. So, so page 12 shows uh, an example um, project scorecard. And, um, and so the scorecard has seven different indicators, and energy carbon, water, uh, uh, indoor water use, outdoor water use, and um, basically the way it works is the uh, the project gets a, a target um, for what the goal is. So let's take, for example, energy use, which is the top indicator on the scorecard. The, a project, based upon its size and usage, gets a target that the project team is trying to target when they design the project. In this case, the, the design is using 46 KBTUs per square foot per year, which is in the green zone, which means it's meeting its uh, requirements. If it were in the yellow into the red zone, it's above its requirements. And so that's basically how it works all the way um, down, through, down through here for the, uh, for the various indicators. So, so it's, it's doing... It's, if it's above its indicators, <clears throat> it would be in the red zone. No, yeah, that's, it would. And so this will. You mean so it's I, using too much energy? It was. It's using too much energy. I got it. So that's the negative using, part yeah, of exactly. it. Yeah, right? exactly. Or it's yeah. using too much water, or yeah. um, it's uh, you know it's it has too much construction waste. Those kinds of things. So the outdoor environment, water. I'm sorry, water outdoor is really doing very well, the best. Yeah, exactly. And the indoor environment is doing very well. Exactly. Yeah, got it. But everything is within the green zone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I just um, had a question about um, language that I had proposed last year, having to do with um, building in some resiliency aspects into um, the the guidelines. A. Did that actually pass into law? I don't. I lost track of it. B. Um, uh, uh, or is that is that are we working on that? Is that something that's uh, that is going to happen or has happened? Yep. Thanks. Is this yep. Dr. Graves? Okay, Dr. Graves. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Dibble. Um, yeah, yes, it did pass in the last session, and we're going ahead with um, uh, integrating uh, resilience across the guidelines. In particular, what we've been working on in the last. Uh, six months uh, is uh, working on future climate files and how they can be used to meet the energy guidelines. Uh, we are also um, uh, working on scoping out the same kind of forward climate uh, projections for site and water design and how that uh, could include a new data set for civil engineers, landscape architects, and also new um, design processes to, to integrate that in. So that's, that's in process. Um, would you just uh, explain to us, uh, either Assistant Commissioner or Dr. Grace, what is the relationship between the Department of Administration and the Center for Sustainable Building Research at the U of M? How is that? Is it a partnership? What is it? 
Yep. Assistant Commissioner. Madam Chair, members, um, so we contract with the with the university um, and Center for Sustainable Building Research through a joint powers agreement. And this is really going back from the inception of the program itself. Um, so um, uh, in Department of Commerce has also been a, uh, involved. The funding flows through Department of Commerce. We have a interagency agreement with Commerce to then facilitates us contracting uh, with the Center for Sustainable Building Research. And then we're in uh, very regular communication um, on a variety of topics on um, where there's uh, any issues coming up on, on projects. Um, Department of Administration doesn't get any general fund dollars for this program, so we don't have any specific staff that are assigned to this. Our, our team at, with Real Estate and Construction Services um, helps coordinate the, the work for the department. Anything you want to add, Dr. Graves? Like, do you have other contracts that you do you have at the center? Yes. Are, um, you, are you supported by the U of M? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, so the, um, Senator Pappas, the, the Center for Sustainable Building Research um, uh, at the university is what's considered a soft-funded center. So um, all of our funding comes from grants and contracts. Um, we don't get any uh, direct funding uh, from the university. So, um, so m most of our work are um, work like this for B3 or SB 2030, uh, or we work with municipalities, for example, like I mentioned, helping them uh, advise on green building ordinances. We do federal research for the Department of Energy and other uh, groups like that, but it's, but it's really kind of a mix of uh, grants and contracts with uh, a variety of groups. So is it your plan, Assistant Commissioner, that you will have some legislation for us to consider uh, yet this session? Madam Chair, uh, yes. We'll, we'll uh, be coming back uh, with some recommendations on legislation. I'm sorry, recommendations on legislation or actual legislative language? Legislative language, and then we'll also, it would likely be a variety of, a menu of options. If there's additional funding right. available, then... Right then we can add in things. If, it's, if there's no funding available, here's what it would look okay, like. Okay, great. Well, keep us in the loop on your work. Thank you. And Senator Chizinski, and then uh, we'll thank, move on. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Dr. Grace, so I'm familiar with a building, and it was a MnDOT building, and they went through the sustainable building guidelines, and I think at the end of the building, they did a, a thermal imaging of the building to make sure it was standard, efficient, things like those. And I guess I just look at, is there, is there an ROI or return on investment that we're looking at? Because in this instance, they had the whole building, thermal energy, or they did a, a, a photo of it and saw where the leakages were. And one example was a fire main, where the fire main comes into the building. So when a fire truck shows up, they can hook up to that. And it showed a small little you know escape of a probably energy coming out there. But it was right next to a 14-foot overhead door that opens probably 30 to 45 mm -hmm. times a day. And we're looking at the... the heat that's escaping, uh, you know, one little small item like that next to a door that's opening, you know, constantly all day. So my question is, there's a, re a return on investment for what we're spending on making sure these buildings are this tight and, and sustainable and, and those versus what it costs to do that. Because I'm assuming the thermal energy report was not cheap to have it done. And again, you're, you're pointing out defects of a small little thing next to an overhead door that's opening like I said, 45 times a day, I'm sure. So do we look at that at all? Just, uh, you know, because we always talk about inflation. And I always sometimes look at inflation as done by regulation because we're putting all more of these more and more requirements on these buildings like this. So we're increasing the cost of them ourselves. And then we always refer to it as inflation. Well, it's regulation because we're adding more things that are costing, making buildings cost more. So do we look at a return on investment for all these extra costs we're making is there a payback over time that we're receiving benefit for these added inflation or regulation, whatever you want to call it? Uh, I, yeah, I can take that. Yeah, I can go ahead. I'm, I'll yeah. Jump to you. yeah, you go first. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Gray. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, Senator Pappas, um, and, and uh, Senator, I appreciate the question. So um, for the energy requirements, there's actually in statute that um, we need to look at return on investment based upon utility standards which for us translates into a 12-year payback. So if we're gonna spend 
additional money for insulation or, you know, I'm assuming this is a fire station, so a big thing in fire stations for efficiency is having a insulated garage door that can open and close quickly so you're not wasting that heat. So all those measures, you would look at what's their additional cost, and then you do an energy model to see if that additional cost is going to pay back within 12 years. So that's the standard, and it's very common for projects to come up with ideas, think about doing it, but you don't do it because it's not gonna, it's not gonna meet that kind of ROI test. Um, and then on the back end, once the design's completed, um, we really review the project, not for kind of individual issues, but kind of overall, you were like, much like I showed in that scorecard where the targets of 46 um, energy usage for the whole building, we then track operations to see as the whole building kind of operating um, within that target, factoring in all the various things that are gonna go on between heat loss from a, um, a door opening and closing in a fire, in a fire station and other, and other losses. So, um, so it's more holistic trying to come up with the, um, the right decisions that, that will pay back and not kind of throw money into things that may not have um, benefits for that building owner. Okay, thank you both very much, appreciate it. Um, next, I'd like to invite uh, Evelyn Weiner to come forward with the uh, Infrastructure Resilience Task Force. And I understand our Senator Jasinski was on this task force. Do you have any comments that you'd like correct. to make about the experience? Was it fun? <laughs> as Madam fun Chair, as the bonding well, tours? I wouldn't say it was as fun as bonding tours, but... Uh, that right, right answer. It was a, a learning experience. Uh, uh, you know, there was a lot of time spent, I guess, is the one... One thing that I would comment, and whether we're going to see the benefits of that, all that time spent would be, would be my question, but there was just a lot of time spent, so I hope some benefits will come out of it uh, because, again, we, we met, I think, seven or eight meetings during the summer, and, and some of them were very lengthy, and, and mm -hmm. so I just hope that the benefits of the, re, of the committee or of the uh, group will, will have some benefits. So Great. Th thank thanks, you. Sure. And welcome, Ms. Is it Weiner? Yes. All right. Welcome, Ms. Weiner, and proceed with your presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. My name is Evelyn Weiner. I was the research analyst from the Legislative Coordinating Commission assigned to the Infrastructure Resilience Advisory Task Force. I also have a slideshow presentation that you should have in your packets. Um, I'm just going to run through the task force and then the recommendations that came out of it. So the task force was established to evaluate issues related to coordination, sustainability, resiliency, and federal funding on state, local, and private infrastructure in the state. It was um, designed to develop objectives and strategies to provide for effective and efficient management of state, local, and private infrastructure, enhance sustainability and resiliency of infrastructure throughout the state, respond to and mitigate the effects of adverse weather events across the state, including natural disasters, droughts, and floods, and provide for equitable treatment in areas of persistent poverty and historically disadvantaged communities. It also served to identify approaches to enhance infrastructure coordination across jurisdictions, agencies, state and local government, and public and private sectors, including in planning, design, engineering, construction, maintenance, and operations. It was to identify methods to maximize federal formula and discretionary funds provided to recipients in the state for infrastructure purposes, and finally, to evaluate options for organizational design of state agencies to meet the purposes above, including consideration of options for establishment of a board, council, office, or other agency, models in other states, and to develop findings and recommendations related to the duties specified in this subdivision. The next slide details the membership of the task force. So as you'll see, it was chaired by Representative Aaron Cagle, and the vice chair was Representative Don Gilman. We also had Senator Jim Carlson and Senator John Jasinski on. I don't think you need to go over sure. the membership. We can look at it. No problem. All right, thanks. Um, the next slide has the, the eight meetings that took place over the time that we had together. Um, in the first meeting, chairs were elected. Second meeting, we heard testimony from the Michigan Infrastructure Council and the Climate Action Framework. The third meeting was discussion-based. The fourth meeting, we heard testimony from the University of Minnesota's Empowering Small Communities Project. In the fifth meeting, members discussed the mission statement. The sixth meeting, the mission statement and board structure were finalized. The seventh meeting was discussion-based again. And then the final meeting, the report was finalized and approved. So the next two slides go over the Michigan Infrastructure Council. This was the base that the members used to, to design the board. Um, it, the Michigan Infrastructure Council is comprised of nine voting members who are representative of one or more of the following 
asset management experts in the public and private sectors, financial and procurement experts from the public or private sector, and experts in regional asset management. Uh, it also is comprised of nine non-voting members, which represent state agencies, including the Water Asset Management Council, the Transportation Asset Management Council, and the Michigan Public Service Commission. The mission and goals of the Michigan Infrastructure Council were to define a vision for Michigan's infrastructure that provides the foundation for public and environmental health, economic prosperity, and quality of life. The five tenants that they used were to collaborate, coordinate, educate, invest, and prioritize. So finally, the recommendations that came out of the task force uh, is a board that would be charged with defining and maintaining a vision for the future of Minnesota's infrastructure that provides for proper management, coordination, and investment. The board would work in a non-regulatory capacity and in tandem with stakeholders to identify and promote best practices that will preserve and extend the longevity of Minnesota's public and privately owned infrastructure. The board would consist of 15 non-voting members that are ex experts in an aspect of infrastructure and 11 voting members. And then the duties of the board would, inc would include, but we're not limited to, electing a chair, hiring an executive director, identifying approaches to enhance and expedite infrastructure coordination across jurisdictions, agencies, state and local government, and public and private sectors. Areas of coordination could include planning, design, engineering, construction, maintenance, and operations. Other duties of the board would include developing an educational program on asset management and writing an annual report to the legislature. And I'm happy to answer any questions on that. And I think I've seen the legislation on this. So, I mean, it will come before us as a bill, potentially, to see if it's something that we, that we want to consider. Um, <clears throat> I don't really know too much about it since it was really kind of a House initiative. But I believe we have the draft, don't we? For this? Yeah, I think we do. Any questions at all for Ms. Weiner? All right. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And we all, ha we all have the final report. <coughs> oh, next I want to welcome Mr. Micah Intermill, who is the Enterprise Director, Federal Funds Implementation with MMB. Um, we are very excited that um, you were hired to kind of help us get more federal money, since we know we have such a uh, huge interest and demand, both from um, our state agencies who need asset uh, preservation, as well as our local governments and our local communities. So looking forward to your presentation, Mr. Intermill. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, candidly, I'm, I'm glad I was hired too. So uh, <laughs> great, great to be here. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Pappas, Vice Chair Fah, Lead Housley, and members of the committee. My name is Micah Intermill. I am the state's enterprise director for federal funds implementation housed at Minnesota Management and Budget. I appreciate the opportunity to join you today uh, and provide an update with respect to how the state is responding to the massive opportunity represented in the three recently enacted federal investment bills, the IIJA, IRA, and CHIPS Act. This presentation is the beginning of a conversation requested by the chair to help provide commi the committee context on the volume of infrastructure investments taking part across the state, which are driven primarily by federal funds. My goal today is to provide uh, education and develop a baseline consensus understanding of the state's approach. Should it interest the committee to go deeper into particular funding areas, uh, I'd be happy to come back and present along with experts from other agencies on how these federal funds are being used to support specific needs across the state. So uh, I believe you have the slides in your packet uh, as well. So uh, just moving to that first slide, I'll start by giving you a high level introduction to the federal funds implementation unit. Uh, which is a new team created in the 2023 legislative session. I'll then provide an overview of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or IIJA, the Inflation Reduction Act, or IRA, and the Chips and Science Act, or CHIPS. Third, we'll get a brief preview of Minnesota's projected IIJA awards to date, and this will be at a very high level, uh, but We'll preview the, uh, any deeper conversation you'd like to have. And finally, uh, I'll share a first look at Minnesota's IIJ and IRA Opportunity Tracker, uh, which is a new tool developed uh, by my team and published literally just days ago. So moving to the next slide, um, it's important to recognize the historical context around these massive generational investments that the federal government is making. As you see at the left of the slide, the story arguably began in November of 2021 with the passage of the IJA. 
The IRA and CHIPS Act followed suit in the summer of 2022, and the three bills became the basis for a great many activities uh, across the state enterprise as agencies set to work almost immediately to seek and bring home available federal resources just as they continue to today. As you'll recall, discussions were had in this committee and others in, 2020, in the 2022 legislative session providing information to the extent it was known uh, on available programs and formula allocations as well as estimated state matching needs. And in 2023, uh, in particular, the legislature appropriated many of the matching dollars uh, necessary and provided enterprise level coordination support through the funding of me and my office, uh, as mentioned, as well as other pos uh, positions across the state enterprise. I think we're trying to make sure that this technology works and we may be slightly striking out. Apologies for that. There we go. We're home. Thank you very much, Ms. Carlson. So that brings us uh, to a fuller discussion of that federal funds implementation team. Because this is a new function, it feels important to help you understand who we are and what we're here to do and how we're approaching our work. So as mentioned, I have the pleasure of serving the state as its enterprise director for federal funds implementation. I come to this role having spent roughly the past 20 years in various roles in and around government both in direct public service at the federal, state, and local level, as well as in the private sector in roles providing support and assistance to professional staff and policymakers alike. Having served in state roles previously, I returned in this capacity last November, drawn by both the challenge and opportunity of starting a team from scratch, as well as just the multi-generational impact um, that the work we facilitate will have. And truly, as I sit here today, I'm more excited about the opportunities ahead for Minnesota than I was the day that I returned to the Capitol campus. I'm currently joined on the team by two others. Uh, one individual who serves as a state agency coordinator working with and between state agencies and outside entities um, to bring alignment to our work and another who serves as our data analyst and communication specialist working together just the vast and varied amounts of data related to the IJ, IRA, and CHIPS Act, so that not only can we inform Minnesotans about the opportunities, um, but better focus our work uh, internally to maximize our efforts as an enterprise. We've also posted and will soon be interviewing for an external relations coordinator who will be responsible for interacting primarily with non-state entities. So uh, think tribal nations, local governments, nonprofit organizations, schools, and others to ensure that they're aware and taking advantage of these federal opportunities as well. The four of us really are here to work across state agencies to ensure successful alignment and implementation of these federal investment bills. I've included a graphic at the right of this slide um, that helps illustrate how we're doing that work. So with a small team and a large charge, we're working to first find gaps in implementation efforts, either within uh, agencies or, or um, between outside eligible entities. Once we find those gaps, we're working to fill them either in direct service roles uh, or um, by connecting individual experts who may be better positioned to solve for problems amongst each other. And finally, and perhaps more importantly, the biggest gear that you see in that graphic, we're here to tell success stories so that individuals and organizations can not only see themselves in the opportunities available, but also understand how to access, the, access those opportunities uh, should they be fit. Finally, we approach the work with the ultimate goal of supporting Minnesota's public infrastructure needs and climate goals by maximizing all available opportunities in all sectors, which is to say we're focusing on Minnesota broadly, so think a lowercase m as opposed to a capital M. So at the end of the day, when the story is written on the IJA, IRA, and CHIPS Act, our state is at the top of the list in terms, yes, of the dollars received, but more importantly, the good work that's funded by these investments. Really appreciate the opportunity to introduce who we are and how we're approaching the work, but uh, I'll now turn the attention to the meat of the investments themselves with an overview of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the CHIPS Act. These three pieces of legislation, which are collectively known as the investment bills, are massive and bring with them a generational opportunity for Minnesota. Beyond their sheer size, it's important to note they work together in complementary ways to achieve various policy goals. As I mentioned earlier, the first bill to pass was the IJA. 
This bill contains $1.2 trillion with a focus on traditional infrastructure. So think roads, bridges, pipes, ports, and so on, as well as transitioning our nation's energy systems to cleaner and renewable energy sources. The IRA overlaps significantly with the IJA in the area of energy transition and also introduces funding opportunities specifically available to support decarbonization and other climate resilience and pollution reduction work. The CHIPS Act, while still providing significant sum of resources, is the smallest of the three bills and its focus is much narrower. It aims to increase American competitiveness by investing deeply in the development of the manufacturing sectors of tomorrow. I've included dollar amounts on the slide to reinforce the size of the opportunities that lie ahead for Minnesota. As I mentioned a few times already, these are truly generational investments. And as you know, through your work on this committee, decisions made about when, where, and how much concrete or steel, concrete to pour or steel to set are ones that our children and grandchildren will experience in their daily lives. And this is true whenever infrastructure investments are being made. What's unique about IJ, IRA, and CHIPS is their size. It can be difficult to immediately understand that a billion and a trillion are not just the next markers past a million. So for context, a million seconds is about 12 days. A billion seconds is half a lifetime or a bit under 32 years. A trillion seconds is more than all of recorded history at a bit under 32,000 years. The point is there's a lot of opportunity in these federal investments and Minnesota is well positioned to take every advantage of them that we can. Before we turn back to the dollars and cents, I wanted to spend a moment touching on the differences between the investment bills and the major federal spending bills that immediately preceded them, those being the CARES Act and ARPA, also known as the Rescue Plan or Recovery Funds. The nature, goals, and funding mechanisms of each set of legislation is fundamentally different, and the differences are important when considering how decisions are made about dollars being spent. CARES and ARPA represented an emergency response to the public health pandemic and the public financial crisis it triggered. The primary goal was to get dollars out quickly to drive that response, so the mechanism used to distribute dollars was large block grant programs with broad spending authority. Awards were made to states and local governments and the governing bodies of each unit was responsible for deciding how to use dollars after they had been received. IRA, IIJ, and CHIPS are steering intentionally directed investments with the goal of effectuating the policy objectives just discussed. The mechanisms used then are to fund individual projects through specific programs. This means that the decision of how to use dollars is being made when applications are going in not when dollars are received. As the committee is considering its work of developing an infrastructure package and contemplating how federal investment opportunities may support the state's dollars, this slide represents important distinction and difference of today's reality from what we experienced under prior federal funds. To the point of intentionally directed investments, this slide represents where and how the federal government is focusing its dollars under the IIJA. The vast majority, just over uh, three of every four dollars of IIJ funding is for transportation projects. Over half of the funds represent a re reauthorization of the FAST Act and support its emphasis on federal surface transportation infrastructure and safety. These dollars are accompanied by additional transportation programming dollars in the areas of roads and bridges, rail, transit, airports and ports, and transportation safety. The IIJA also provides significant funding in traditional infrastructure areas of broadband and water infrastructure, as well as monies to support our environment through the stewardship of public lands. Finally, as mentioned, the legislation carries a secondary emphasis on climate and clean energy with 10 cents of every dollar going to support investments in energy and the power grid, electric vehicle infrastructure, and climate resilience and adaptation. This is all very good news as Minnesota has massive needs in these areas in all corners of the state. However, in general, these monies are not programmed to support the asset preservation needs or new construction of public buildings, which of course represents a major need in communities across Minnesota and is an emphasis of this committee. Uh, just a minute, Mr. Intermill. Um, so the FAST Act reauthorization, that's kind of an existing funding that we have for transportation projects, basically. So it's just kind of continuing what was already there. Madam Chair, that's, that's the right half of the 
of the chart, and then the rest of it is new funding? Um, uh, uh, that's a good question, and actually the next slide speaks directly to that. Okay, I'll hold my comments. Not at Thank all. Thank you. You're, you're well on track for the presentation. Um, to that, <laughs> there are two other important points to consider when thinking about the grants. So first, roughly uh, three quarters of the grant funding made available is allocated based on those formula calculations. These formulas are based on different factors depending on which funding area we're looking at, but the how much story on those funds has been written. The remaining quarter of IIJA grant funds are being dispersed through competitive award processes. Minnesota is being aggressive in pursuing these competitive opportunities, and I'll share more on those successes in uh, a few slides. But to the chair's comment, the second artifact of the IIJA grant ecosystem to keep in mind is 75% of grant funds have been made available through reauthorization of previous programs. So both the FAST Act, as you saw on the previous slide, as, other as well as other programs. Once planning for an infrastructure project begins, it's often years uh, before ground is broken on a facility, road, or bridge, and it's in having faith in the reauthorization process that allowed us to have shovel-ready projects that took advantage of IIJ funding early on. The remaining quarter of grant opportunities made available through new programs represent work that is pushing boundaries, either by equipping more shovel-ready projects than otherwise would have been funded or providing funding for new areas such as the National Electric Vehicle Charging Network. Uh, both segments of that pie, while unequal in size, are equally important to modernizing infrastructure in our state. So I'll turn back to the IIJ result, uh, results to date in a moment, but I did want to touch briefly on federal funds under IRA and CHIPS. So the graphic at the left of the slide represents funding mechanisms contained within the IRA. So whereas most, fundings of it, most funding opportunities available under the IIJA are executed through grant agreements, the IRA is more complex and nuanced. The IRA contains three key mechanisms to distribute funds, grants, loans, and tax credits. Grant programs are capped at 110 billion. Loan programs are capped at approximately 500 billion. The third set of funds, clean energy tax credits, are uncapped, meaning there's as much money available as there is demand to use them. Estimates of the value of those credits range, varies, uh, ranging from $700 billion to $1.2 trillion. These credits are bigger than previous clean energy tax credits on a project-by-project -project basis. They're broader than previous programs, and for the first time, uh, importantly for us, they are available as direct payments to non-taxable entities, including states like Minnesota, as well as local governments, tribal nations, nonprofits, schools, and others, and they're intended to immediately drive down the cost of switching from traditional fuel sources to renewable ones. The only catch with the credits is that they come after a project has been put into service, as opposed to a grant, which would be available to spend at the outset of a project. That's where the guaranteed loans come uh, to provide a means for bridge and gap financing of projects at low costs. Final details of the tax credit program are still being worked out, and non-taxed entities of all stripes, including the state, are working together to inform the federal government on how best to finalize them. Turning back to those grants uh, for a moment, like the IIJA, the grants available under the IRA represent a whole-of-government approach, as they come from several different agencies representing various policy objectives, uh, with emphasis on the clean energy transition, conservation, climate resilience, and pollution reduction efforts. Notably though, in a meeting la late last year, uh, the Department of Energy noted 70% of IRA grant opportunities were either decided or in the process of being awarded. So while we continue to aggressively pursue opportunities like the Climate Pollution Reduction Grants or Solar for All program, among others, tax credits and loans truly remain the largest opportunity to bring federal funds back to Minnesota under the IRA. That then brings us to the CHIPS Act, which, uh, as the graphic suggests, brings a three-pronged approach focused on driving economic security, national security, and future scientific innovation. Like the IRA, this legislation utilizes a mix of funding approaches, including manufacturing incentives, workforce development funds, tax credits for development and equipping of manufacturing facilities, and future authorizations of additional research and development funds. 
in the interest of time and uh, turning back to the IIJA, we'll move to a summary of projected funding for Minnesota to date, and this will be a high-level review of where we're seeing the money flow. I've also got a summary of various projects funded through the IIJ, which we can uh, either go through quickly or uh, in, in a little bit of detail. This chart and the associated graphic represent the projected funding picture for Minnesota under the IIJA. These figures are informed by information obtained on February 6th from an organization known as Federal Funds Information for States, or FFIS, and includes both the announced competitive awards as well as calculated formula allocations. MMB and other states uh, rely on FFIS to provide a comprehensive database of these proje projected funds so that we can see and understand how our experience relates to others. This service is invaluable, but it also comes with a caveat. Because of the complexities of delivering capital programming over multiple years, some programs do not fully distribute the calculated formula amounts, meaning the dollars that we ultimately receive will be fewer than the amounts shown on this slide. And this is most prevalent in the transportation space. As a result, my colleagues at MnDOT manage to a different number than shown here so that they can ensure that they don't fall short of funds needed to complete a given project. Other areas such as water have their own operational differences from the nationally reported state-specific numbers, so you may hear differences in that area when speaking with the PFA as well. Caveats aside, when MMB first came to this committee two years ago to talk about the IIJ, all that was known was that Minnesota was set to receive a calculated formula allocation of $7.4 billion. Today, I'm extremely happy to report that while that number has not changed, it's joined by roughly $2.3 billion of competitive awards that would not have come but for the hard and high quality of work performed across agencies in all corners of the enterprise. As we sit here today, Minnesota has claimed $9.7 billion of IAJA monies. The fact that Minnesota's mix of formula and competitive grant funding sits very near the 76-24 split shared on a previous slide should not be taken for granted. To the contrary, it's a testament to the fact that agencies have been doing the work they need to do to make sure Minnesota is not left behind. And if my team and I have done our jobs, we'll only see the share of competitive awards grow in the coming months and years. So, uh, Madam Chair, the next two slides contain uh, information on uh, just selected highlights of projects and funding under the IIJA. I um, would be happy to go into a little bit of detail on these or let the committee uh, just simply review and digest depending on your uh, preference for how we use our time. Uh, me. Um. It looks like you're doing selected highlights. I was just going to suggest you do selected highlights. But I really would like to have a comprehensive list. Sure. But this is fine for today. Absolutely. So uh, we'll, we'll leave the, the next two slides as they are um, and certainly be uh, happy to provide you with that uh, list, uh, a fuller list of, of funding uh, under the IIJA. And the amount of, of dollars would be helpful too. Yep. Ab absolutely. So uh, the last thing I, I did want to touch on briefly is the um, just released IIJ opportunity tracker. Oh, so sorry, sorry. just turning to that last slide then, um, when I started this role in November, I met with various stakeholder groups and individuals, and in general, they said two things. First, it's hard to get eligible entities, whether local units of government, tribal nations, or others, to understand the opportunity ahead of them because of the federal funds fatigue in the wake of ARPA and CARES, and because there's not a simple, easy clearinghouse of available opportunities. The second thing that I consistently heard was that the state of Michigan had a, a really good federal funds tracker. Um, I couldn't be prouder of my team as they worked tirelessly over the past month to ensure that Minnesota would have an opportunity tracker of its own to help residents, businesses, and local governments and our partner tribal nations quickly and easily digest the current and upcoming IIJ opportunities. Folks can use this tracker to search by category, fiscal year, and soon entity type to learn more about the programs and funds available. I encourage you all to navigate to the URL shown on the slide and share it widely with your staff, your constituents, and anyone else interested in finding out how Minnesotans can take advantage of the historic opportunities under the IIJA. 
And the last point I'll make uh, on the tracker is that it, what you see when you navigate to that site is a first iteration or V1. Um, we'll plan to continue to enhance the quality of the information uh, and usability of the tool. And we also have plans to include data and information on awarded funds uh, in the coming weeks as well. So please stay tuned to that. Ms. Turner Mill, um, we, because of, of the volume of requests that we've had, um, we typically ask local governments to you know, do their best to provide 50% match. Is there, are there requirements like that from the IIJA in general, or does it vary from, from category to category? Yeah, absolutely, Madam Chair. The, um, it does vary from category to category. There are some funds that are available that require zero match. There are others that require 10, 20, 50% match. So it, it is a bit across the board program okay, by program. Thank you. Madam Chair. Senator Chizinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ermill. So I see we have the tracker and things like that, but are, are you and your staff out actively talking with cities and counties and institutions like that to educate them what's available, how they get in, all those things, uh, rather than just having a tracker? I get that's good, but it's always nice to have that, that sales pitch out there to educate them on how to get more funds, how to, how to work through the system, how to make it easier for them. Because I know some of the larger cities have staff that do that, but if you look at some of our smaller cities, especially below 5,000, they don't have the staff to understand all this. So tell me a little bit about how you plan on getting out to the, our smaller cities, townships, and those people to educate them on how they can get more money uh, leveraged so they can use that. Unfortunately, Mr. Intermill was hired uh, after we completed most of our bonding tours, but I did invite him to join us, and I think you did join us for a couple tours that were local. But go ahead and Absolutely. answer. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator. It's a, it's a great question and an important point. Um, so uh, when, when I did come on to, uh, into the role, I was able to meet with representatives from uh, the league and the Association of Counties, as well as the Minnesota Townships, um, and sort of began to build that relationship around uh, being able to educate on a broad scale. Uh, right now, we only have uh, two out of three staff in addition to me hired, but as I had mentioned, that fourth position that we're bringing on is an external relations coordinator. So their role truly will be to interact with local units of government, nonprofits, the uh, K-12 and higher education system to ensure that they are uh, tracking, for lack of a better term, uh, what all of these opportunities are, and particularly some of the complexities around the, the tax credits. I leaned into that a little bit in my prepared remarks intentionally because, as I had said, not only are those uncapped, they're also non-competitive, meaning if you have a project that is eligible, you will get funds, and that will help buy down the cost of those energy improvements. And that's something that non-tax entities in particular, they've never filled out a tax return. So this is something that they need education and coaching on. So um, we, along with the Department of Commerce and others, are engaged in those conversations regularly, meeting with various groups. But certainly, to your point, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of local governments of varying sizes. And so absolutely also working in partnership with the um, large uh, uh, interest organizations that support those entities as well. You mentioned um, tax credits. Typically, you think of tax credits as something a business can use or an individual. You know, how does that apply here to you know, government? Yes, if Madam Chair, that is a great question. And uh, so this is the first time this has ever been available to governments. So the, um, it's, it's a concept called direct pay or elective pay, where essentially the, the government um, the local government, the state government, uh, a school will um, put a project into service and then receive, in essence, a rebate from the federal government equal to what a tax credit would have been had they been a private entity. Is this also available to nonprofits then as well? And how does that differ from, we hear a lot about the new market tax credits. Do you know what the, if there's a difference there? So, um, Madam Chair, I, I think uh, I'm hesitant to go deeply into differences, but I think all of these things uh, are, are built to work together, again, to, to drive down the cost of transition to, uh, to renewable sources. Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I had some questions, too, on the tax credits. 
Um, and you answered part of that question uh, regarding the direct pay. And in a sense, um, we would say that's kind of like having a refundable tax credit, basically, only it's refundable from the federal government. Uh, the other question, and if, if that's how that works, uh, then I was going to say, were they assignable or transferable? Which would actually make them even more valuable if they were assignable or transferable tax credits. And it would also bring in private funds to help uh, in these instances. Are these uh, tax credits assignable or transferable? Ms. Jenner Mill. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and Senator. Uh, they, the, the direct pay are not. So the, the private sector use of these tax credits are transferable. The previously uh, uh, untaxed uh, population, those are not transferable. Madam Chair? Yes, Senator follow. Nelson. And, and so, so thank you for that clarification. And then I also want to follow up on the chairs. So how would nonprofits <clears throat> participate then? Would that be through assignable and transferable tax credits? Or would that be the direct pay? So talk to me a little bit about the nonprofits. Ms. Jenner Mill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator, a nonprofit would uh, apply just the same as the state will, which is um, to register a project with the IRS put that project into service, and then once the project is in service, come back to the IRS for the direct payment um, in the, at the time that they would typically file uh, were they uh, a taxable yes. entity. And then, Madam Chair, last question. Senator Nelson. Thank you. So that's very interesting. And then I just want to make sure I understand that there is no cap on that direct pay then. Madam Chair and Senator, that is correct. There, there is no cap. And that's why on the slide you saw there are estimates of, yes. of how much money ultimately will be spent through the tax credits. Um, low end estimates currently sit at $700 billion. High end estimates currently sit at $1.2 trillion, depending on which group you're listening to in Washington, D.C. or New York City. Thank you. Madam Chair, I guess Senator that's... I guess that's no, what you can do when you don't have to have a balanced budget. <laughs> you don't have to have a cap when you print on money. those type of things. Yeah, when you can print money, that's maybe It does appear works. to be the limit, though. This is part of the Inflation Reduction Act. So it has to be a project defined as an energy transition or climate. Can you expand on that a little bit? What type of projects might those be? Absolutely, Madam Chair. So um, product, projects that we're talking about really uh, are renewable energy projects. So think um, solar, uh, solar projects uh, either on a facility or uh, a field, you know, wind projects, um, also geothermal heat pumps and, and things of that nature. I think there are components that it's a complex program in that there are base credits available and then bonus credits that Maybe so bonus credits may be available depending on the particular geography that the product project exists in um, as well as um, uh, sort of uh, American made uh, uh, materials and, and other things like that. So those of you who were on the Northwest tour, I think most of us were on the Northwest tour. We were up in Crookston campus at the U of M and they had their coal fired furnace, which is um, needs to be replaced and they were planning to replace it with a coal-fired furnace. And I said, no, you can't do that. That's a 30-year investment. Why aren't you doing something else? And they said they looked at geothermal. It was too expensive. right? So that's the kind of project that they might be able to fund through the, um, through the uh, I, uh, IRA. I can't keep them straight. Uh, to me, the IRA is the Irish Republican Army or something. <laughs> I think it's a retirement plan. Oh, yeah, it's also a retirement plan, right? That's that, too, the IRA, right? Um, at any rate, it would be good to, for you to let Crickson know <laughs> that uh, they, they might be able to get some funding. But it doesn't fund the total cost. And it was super expensive, as I recall, to do that. $40 million, I don't remember now the number. Yeah, cer yeah, certainly, Madam Chair. And I think each project pencils differently. Uh, and so... What the tax credits do is somewhat buy down the total cost of transition, but then in conjunction with the loans, help to spread right. that cost out over time. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you. Just one final question. Very interesting report, by the way. Thank you so much. On the FFIS, the Federal mm -hmm. Funds Infrastructure uh, Services, 
I know I've been on that website before, but I thought I needed a password. Is it, can, can legislators get to this, or how do we get to this? Uh, Madam Chair and Senator, that's a great question. I'm not sure the restrictions on our subscription, but I will look into that and, and get back to you offline. Th thank you so much. Great. Any other questions? All right, well, we hope we'll be seeing a lot of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, then our final presentation today is uh, the Office of State Auditor. Um, glad you could come and join us. I, we had hoped to see you earlier, and I know we rescheduled. Thank you. Um, and glad you're here today. All right. About the uh, infrastructure stress transparency tool. Set my, we'll set our stuff up and then. And uh, welcome State Auditor Blaha. Thank you, Chair Pappas, uh, Vice Chair, uh, Vice Chair Fa, uh, Leader Housley, members of the committee, so happy to be here today. Oh, what did I just do? Okay, there we go. Uh, I'm putting up the uh, handout that we have to start here uh, so that if you want to play along at home, uh, you can go right to the QR code, uh, and that's for those of you watching online. You can also join in the fun. Um, I'm also joined by senior researcher uh, John Jernberg, who will be walking through the specifics of the tool uh, today. So basically, uh, we're here today to talk about inf water infrastructure, and, uh, but more specifically to visualize it. Uh, the Minnesota Infrastructure Stress Tan Transparency Tool uh, provides maps and it also reports on size, location, age, finances, a number of, of metrics about our uh, district water and sewer systems. Uh, and so this tool, is, the idea is to bring the data sets together and to help visualize them. The project grew out of the University of Minnesota's 2015 Smart Cities and Infrastructure Con Convergence Colloquium. I don't use the word colloquium enough in my life. Uh, and um, the Office of the State Auditor was part of a serendipity grant that came out of that. Um, now, this data isn't uh, just ours, of course. It comes from, it's a collaboration between U Spatial at the University of Minnesota and infrastructure data experts from agencies, including the Department of Health, um, Pollution Control, uh, Public Facilities Authority, uh, Infrastructure Alliance used to be uh, Minnesota 250. Um, and uh, in fact, we do have people here with us today from those groups. In fact, uh, Len Kenny, who's the director of U-Spatial, a research and commuting at the, computing at the University of Minnesota. Uh, Chad Colstead is also here. He's a supervisor for drinking water protection infrastructure, uh, the infrastructure unit at the Minnesota Department of Health, and Bill Dunn the Clean Water Revolving Fund Coordinator is here. So if you have some deep questions about the data, they're available uh, for us. But let's get right to the fun of it and get into the tool. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn this over to, again, um, OSA Senior Researcher, John Jernberg. And welcome, Mr. Jernberg. Thank you, Madam. <clears throat> is this on? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, Chair Pappas and honorable members of the committee. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to um, show you something we're pretty proud of. Uh, and this kind of, a lot of our agencies have silos of data and they're not brought together. And what this tool does is it brings those silos together and it not only um, allows us to show them visually, the data visually, but also um, gives a dashboard for each entity that is represented um, within our data. Uh, so what I'm gonna start out with is um, the data, let's see here, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, we, we, <laughs> Yes, Auditor Blaha. Senator Pappas, we were debating about which of your uh, legislative districts to use. And so we have been digging into all of them and looking at which ones have the most interesting data visualizations. So if you have specific questions, we can hook you up. <laughs> okay. As we, look at, as we look at this dashboard, um, there's five different tabs. And under each tab, you can select different things. 
And when we look at maps, we look at four different types of maps. And um, it's related to um, collection and treatment, the financial aspects under sewer enterprise and water enterprise, and then asset management. And for each map, um, and right now we're looking at the predominant collection sewer system age. And when, when you select a map, next to that selection you'll see a legend. And in this case, circles represent cities, diamonds represent special districts, and the colors represent the age, predominant age of the sewer collection system. And so in this case, green is less than 30, uh, yellow is between 30 and 50 years old, and red is, uh, is over 50 years old. And the size of the dot or the diamond represents how many miles of sewer systems in, in the city or special district. And we also have a shading um, that, that will tell you is it closer to 100% that's red or you know, 67, 50%. So we, it also provides that type of information. To look at a specific entity, you can either click on a circle or a diamond, or you can use the search box to enter in a name of a city or a special district. To zoom in on an area, you can um, use the, the plus or minus to zoom in, and, um, or you can use your scroll to, to move in that, in that way. The other thing that, our, that the tool has is the ability to um, select geographic boundaries that we look at. And we have counties, basins, watersheds, and House and Senate districts. So if we look at a Senate boundary, and, uh, oops, and then we go to filters, and we have various filters. We have demographic filters, um, such as population, household, median household income, so you can, can select things that way. Um, but I'm gonna look at geography filters, and we can just look at a Senate district. And so what I'm gonna take a look at is um, Senate District 19, and there you go, sir, <laughs> Senator. Thank and, you. Um, <laughs> So it's just going to highlight that dis the the entities in that district because those may be of your of, you know your most concern. And if we want to look at the data for Madam entities, Madam Chair, Senator Friends, thank you. I'm cheering for Senator Jasinski as much as anybody, but I think we have actually Senate District 18 on here now that the numbers have changed. Which wouldn't you know what I represent? Which I think is just super. I just didn't want to have any. <laughs> back and forth between me and Senator Jasinski so we can bring bipartisan support to this outstanding district and the infrastructure in it, unless you want to put 19 up there, which That's is That's never happened east. back and forth, so if you could put side by side, then we could have a little competition. Members, I, I apologize. This year, my district changed from 19 to 18, uh -huh. and so I think what's on the screen here is District 18, which is the old 19, okay. which is Mankato, North Mankato, oh, St. Peter, okay. and Olive Rural, Nicollet so County. not Fairbolt. We we do which have which is great I think if you think so about. so um, auditor Blaha thank thank you uh, thank you Chair Pappas and uh, good point we do have a new version of this coming out this week <laughs> and I'm guessing that overlay might be one of those things that will also yeah. be in there all right well again we're focusing on okay so I, um, <laughs> so if I click on a dot here and I, I'm not sure which city this is going to be <laughs> um, so this is Cortland. And so this is, this is the dashboard for the city of Cortland. And um, no, first we have the demographic right. information, population, household, median, in, um, medium household income. And then as we um, go to the next thing, which is collection sewer system by age category, um, in this case, 100% of the system is less than 30 years old. And we can scroll down, and um, the wastewater treatment facility in this case is operated by the city of New Ulm. And 
wastewater charges, residents are typically charged $35, <coughs> excuse me, $35 per 5,000 gallons per month used. And then uh, this is who pays um, the maintenance, operating maintenance costs by connection type. So in this case, 89% um, is paid by residential users and 10% um, by non-residential users. We then get into financial information. It doesn't operate its own sewer system, so there are not um, financial numbers there. It has no clean water um, projects on the pro um, um, priority project list, clean water project priority list. Then this is the amount of drinking water usage and storage within the city. And um, I'm not gonna go into the details of what this represents, but if you have a question, for each item within the dashboard, there's a little I and, oops, can't get to that. Uh, oh yeah, there we go. So if you select if you select the I, I don't know why that's doing that. I can reduce this way down. Oh, it was reduced. It. <laughs> um, but it, it will show you information about what that represents. So in this case, we have drinking water assets. The number of wells are two. Uh, treatment plants, one. Storage is one. It's elevated. Um, so it provides that type of information. Uh, this would provi provide water enterprise fund income information. So if things are operating, um, if, if the amount of revenues coming in pays for the service, it's going to be above the red. If it's below, it means it's, it's operating in the red. Um, and we have net income, operating income, and operating income excluding depreciation. And depreciation often for these big... Um, for systems like this, the depreciation, especially on a newer, um, I believe in this city was 100%, was less than 30 years old, the depreciation costs are going to be very high, and so that that affects the operating income and the net income. Because those, it, so we. So, Mr. Jernberg, where do you where do you get this information? This is the questions we ask when we're on bonding tours. <laughs> So the financial information comes from the Office of the State Auditor, um, and the, the office issues every year um, reports that are called, um, you know, Minnesota City Finances 2022, for example. And if you go to the enterprise section of that report, you can, you can find this information. There. We also have it available for download. So these cities are required to provide this information to the office? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Chairman Pappas, that is correct. Okay. They are required to report to us. Okay. Um, another... Just a minute before you continue. Center Friends has another correction about the district no, numbers. No. Um, first of all, <laughs> thank you, Senator Pappas, and thanks, members. Uh, this is incredible, and I just wanted to point out to the members that we do have an Eagle Lake water bonding project, and since I know you got a green dot, um, if you click on that, that, then I'll at least be able to say that I brought the Eagle Lake water project to the attention of the committee <laughs> as we looked at the state auditor's transparency site. It's all the way to the east, right up against Senator Drayheim's district. Right. No, no. Uh, uh, see where it says main Oh, east. Down, straight down, right yeah, there. There. Click that That's going to show up in our data again, is it? So what, what's interesting about something that we're proud of about this is we can compare two cities in your district side by side, mm -hmm. and um, as you scroll well, down, like. you're looking at the same information mm -hmm. side by side. And so you can see, you know, the... the um, Residents are typically charged this amount, and you can see the age of the systems, things like that. So it's side by side. <laughs> um, and again, in this case, Eagle Lake does have a sewer enterprise fund, so the financial information is there, but Cortland does not, so there's no financial information. If a city has failed to report to our office, um, Again, there would not be data for that given year. Uh, so we can go down side by side and see 
all of that information. Mr. Jernberg, what's a sewer um, enterprise fund? A sewer enterprise fund, uh, Madam Chairman, is, is a proprietary type of accounting, much like the private sector, where it shows um, you know, revenues or fees that are paid into the, into the city for the service. Um, sorry, my lips are drying up here a little bit. Um, so enterprise fund accounting is very much like private sector accounting. We have um, operating revenues, operating expenses, um, non-operating revenues, non-operating expenses, and you come up with a net income. And this allows us to see if the fees that are charged by the city or the special district are covering the costs of providing the service. And we want to see that um, you know, above, at least in the positive zone. So it's not um, uh, increasing their reserve for potential replacement. It's just making sure that they have the operating dollars they need for the current sewer system. Chairman Pappas, they, um, part, of, part of the operating expense is depreciation. Mm -hmm. And depreciation is, um, it's, it's kind of a paper expense. It is what should be set aside mm -hmm. for future replacement. That doesn't mean that that is necessarily being set aside, but mm -hmm. that is in their books what should be set aside for replacement costs in however many years the depreciation schedule is on. Senator Jasinski. Thank, Thank you, Madam Chair. Just going back to my mayor days, so the easiest way I understood was it's not like non-general funds. So usually have a general fund for your city to operate. This is enterprise funds where you're actually collecting revenues and paying expenses. So the water sewer is a very typical one of that. But it took me a while to figure that I out. I see. It's, just, it's a separate fund. That's it's all. It's like a, well, right. like revenue bonds. It's revenue right. funds. So it's anything yeah. you're collecting a fee on and then you're paying back outside the general That's fund. Outside of the, city. the general fund. Got it. Right. Senator Pa. So I just want to say this is an incredible tool. I should have spent some time playing with it after this. Uh, but I'm wondering if we can pull a report for, off of this site where, let's say, I'm particularly interested in the cities or counties uh, that have infrastructure that's over 50 years old. Is, can I pull a report that lists all of that versus going through each one and looking at the red dots? Um, thank you, Senator Fah. The We don't currently have the ability to download that, but as part of the filters, we, we have financial filters. And so we could look at um, number of years with positive net income. And so if we just selected zero, um, we would only get those cities that that have that. So there, there's ways to look at that in, in the larger context. What I would say is that that is something for, that we would like to include in the future. And um, it is also, the information is also available per data request from either our office mm -hmm. or Department of Health or um, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And again, the Office of the State Auditor um, is the expertise on the financial aspect of it. A lot of the things on the project priority list and, and things like that are Department of Health. And, and so we have like Chad Colander and Bill Dunn um, from Department of Health and, and Minnesota Pollution, Pollution Control Agency who are the experts in those areas. But um, that it's a great question and, it, and it's something that we would like to incorporate. Every little piece costs, costs money and we've had, um, it was originally funded through the Serendipity Grant and then a, a Bush Foundation Grant and then the Office of the State Auditor funded um, the next upgrade and the, the upgrade that's occurring right now is from the through the Department of Health and their lead service lines. So there's going to be a new map that's showing all of the lead service lines in the state of Minnesota. 
and that's part of, mm -hmm. it's not gonna be mapped on this map, it's a, that's a, that will be a separate piece, but it will also, um, it's, it's also helping fund the upgrade of um, both updating the data and kind of a new look to it, which will be coming out, that part will be coming out later this week. Uh, Chair Pappas, um, yeah, Ms. Blaha. Pappas, uh, Senator Fah, uh, and we welcome those asks. Uh, the kind of data that you're looking for really helps um, us form how we want to present the data going forward. So uh, we, we'd be happy to be your first call for help on this data. John will hook you up. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Senator Pa. Um, as we did our bonding tours, there were so many communities, county, cities that we spoke with uh, that often talked about their water and sewer needs, and they didn't know how they compare with others. Um, I wonder how many of, I'm sure some of the bigger cities may be aware of this tool. There's a lot of smaller towns, counties that, uh, uh, that do not know of this tool. And I think this would be super helpful for them because some of them were paying really high sewer charges and they thought that was normal. Uh, and then some of them were paying very low and they thought that was really high. <laughs> we're like, no, uh, compared to others, you're not that high. Uh, so this is a great tool for, for our entire state uh, to mm -hmm. use in, um, in a lot of information that they can pull from here. Thank you so much for introducing this. Thank you. Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just also wanted to add, really, what a great tool this is. And uh, it kind of makes me think you were channeling our chair who asked a number of these questions at every, uh, every water project utility that we looked at. And my question is, as a member of this committee, looking at all of those projects, and wouldn't it be interesting to have a little booklet of all of the projects? I mean, just a little snapshot of every project that was on the bonding tour that had these particular requests. Oh, not every project. No, 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 not all three Not all, three, not all no, 364. No, just, <laughs> just, the, just the water ones, the utility oh. ones, where we have this information. Um, Very I'm, interesting. That, they submitted MMB forms to last summer to in June, so I think that information is available. I don't know if MMB can pull a report on just the water and sewer projects. So, um, but that's, that's, it is available. Madam Chair. Senator Nelson. Yeah. So I just also noted uh, how I thought the one metric was really important too, which was as you were looking at those utility fees, you looked at what percent of the median income of that is for the community, because every community is so very different. But I think um, it would be great to get a list, well, maybe someone has an intern who can do that and pull a pull a sheet for each one of the water projects that we looked at, and it would be so interesting to compare mm -hmm. that uh, percent of median income that was being paid, uh, uh, that. so anyway, just a very great tool, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think those questions are not on the MMB form, so maybe, mm -hmm. but they're on her side. It, it sounds right. like I'm being invited no. to go on a trip, yes. uh, <laughs> or someone, or maybe, uh, uh, but I think that the idea of how do we make this available or make sure we're training somebody on your team so that when they go out, they have this available and they can pop it out. Mm -hmm. That might be, we also have other comparison tools on our site where we compare budgeting and things like that. And I think maybe just the idea of training someone on the team so that they're ready uh, to use them. Nelson. Just one more question to follow up on that though. Is this um, a printable thing? So literally, literally, if we wanted to compare the different projects that we've seen on the bonding tour regarding uh, the services that you've put here, is this a, a, how would we compare those? Or if we wanted to rank those in order of percent a median income or something, how would, we, how would we take that data? Let's say we had 40 of these projects. How would we be able to analyze using the great data that you have these 40 projects? I'm not clear if there's a printable page or if you can get the data in a spreadsheet. I'm just not sure how that, what that would look like. Uh, Auditor Blaha. Thank you, Chair Pappas. Senator Nelson, I, I think that it's not in the form. I, 
I love what you're thinking of. <laughs> and also, um, but I think the idea, we can certainly talk about, if you gave us parameters of what you're looking for, how can we get that in a form that's usable for you? Um, and how can we pull that? And we could pull you something, I think. We can make a pull like that. Um, but, um, and I also hear, uh, I see, I know that Lynn uh, uh, Kenny is here too, who, by the way, the discussions we are having about the new uh, data dashboards that we are building for our office, and again, thanks for that support. Um, for that, he, he is also working on those projects for us too. So I just basically say, Len can do it. We'll find a way. <laughs> so let us know what you're looking for. We'll see. What we Senator can Nelson, out. the staff, um, when we're visiting projects, also sends them a template of the information we'd like to see presented. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you'll see a um, you know a community, a town will give a presentation, and we'll go, that was great. We don't have any questions. <laughs> you, you've answered it all for us. And other times it's like pulling teeth to kind of get information because they haven't thought about their water and sewer fees and, you know, it's kind of a complicated formula and we would like it in a more, you know, it's kind of simple, just average, give us your average fee for a household of four, you know, what, how much water do you use and how much do you charge? And that's what we're really kind of looking for. So we can do that internal kind of comparisons. But, Madam Chair, Senator the Nelson. one thing that I didn't get in a, that I thought was so important here is that it showed percent of median income because yeah. that's so different on how those fees impact different economic areas uh, in, that are looking at yeah. this. So I, to me, I just thought that particular piece would be incredibly mm -hmm. helpful as, as we try to weigh out all of those pieces. Absolutely, and that is also one of the questions we do ask them with the template, um, and you know whether they provide it or not is a, another question. Then we have to ask again on this side of the table, Senator Jasinski. So I know we're getting late. I just want to, one last thing. So again, I would thank you for this is a great tool, and I've actually been playing around the website as well. The reports and data analysts that actually shows every city's budget, the general fund, how they compare to other cities as well. So that's another great feature under the reports and data analysts. Uh, but. Uh, uh, Auditor Blau, so uh, one question on the sewer and operating maintenance cost paid. There's a circle there. If you can click on one of those, there's a number inside the circle. What is that number? Can you understand the question? I'm trying to find it out, but I can't, so. If we could. You can um, scroll down, if you scroll down, right, that blue circle. So what's the dollar amount in the middle there? The one is 71,000, the other side. What, what's that dollar amount in the middle represent? Uh, uh, Chair Papa, Senator Jasinski, can I turn this over? Yeah. To, yeah. Uh, director. Okay. <laughs> yes, um, Mr. Jernberg. Mr. Jernberg, yes. Yes. Uh, Chairman, <coughs> Chair, Chairperson Pappas, um, Senator, that is the, the total operating and maintenance costs paid per, per year. If you look at, uh, gosh, why does that do that? Here, let me try something. I think, I think that's what, probably what it was. It was inside the blue circle there, yeah. Is there anything you can Yeah. It's a little jerky. Did that help? Yeah, let's see. Um, so what we see here is, well, actually, Chad's still here? Chad? Oh, that's why I guess. Um, so it's, it's, it's the income from all sources used to pay the, at this point, this one's the 20, 2014 annual cost of wastewater collection and treatment. And so that's, that's what that number represents in this in this so that was the 77,000 up in the middle of the circle yeah so so those are not real time though that sounds like an awful big delay from 20 what did you say 2014 that's 10 years old data and if, you know I, I like the data but if it's 10 years old that maybe that's not telling us an accurate picture uh, chairman Pappas and uh, Senator this will all this should all be updated um, again Hopefully this week we'll have the updated numbers. It's been a while since since this has been updated. Um, this particular um, feature. Um, so we're you just clicked on the, there must be footnotes of, of that dollar amount. So uh, how did you get to that point so you can see how old the data is? Again, if it's if it's ten year old data, I don't know if it's doing us great good. But if it's 
if it's going to be updated, then it will be. And is there? I'm assuming there's a, probably one fiscal year delay to to accumulate all the data and things like that. So, at some point, will it be one or a two-year delay versus a ten-year delay? Is that what we're hoping? Um, if we could speak to that, Chair Plaha. Uh, I'm sorry, Auditor Block. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Pappas, uh, Senator Jasinski. Uh, this is one of the things that we have done in my term is that we have decided to um, include these regular updates in our basic uh, our, in our uh, basic operating costs, so that we should have that. There was a, there has been delays throughout uh, the project, but now we are back on to regular updates for that. Now, again, it, it may be more than one fiscal year, though. Too, uh, unfortunately, this data can lag too can lag a couple of years. Uh, partly for it, it's got to get through the audit, then get into the into the uh, entity, and then get back to us. Um, but no, that is uh, a, a change that we've, we've made, that it will be regularly updated. Uh, so members, my computer whiz to the left here just said there is a way to pull a summary report um, from this tool based on age of system. And she found there are 156 systems that are over 50 years old. And that's certainly what we saw a lot of those systems, right? All right, thank you very much. If there's no other questions, this has just been a great uh, uh, committee hearing and a great presentation to wrap up with, and we appreciate all your work, and we'll look forward to using the tool. Uh, thank you, um, Senator and committee. Uh, we will take your advice also on getting the word out and continuing to publicize this tool. Thank great. you. Thank you. All right, committee is adjourned. Thank you.